Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. I think now we are all set. I can see Zuhura, Patricia, Halima, Lina. Naima, we can start off the meeting now. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Naima Bikadi. I work for Center for Rights Education Awareness. And uh, just a brief introduction on uh, today's webinar is that CRU in partnership with Equality now commission a study on uh, sexual and gender based violence and protection policies and program in Kenya. And uh, in the finding of the research, the, the finding of the research that was done indicates that there is a need to explore and discuss more prevention strategies as a lot of strategies are response based. So um, today's discussion will focus more on the various prevention strategies, the challenges and the gaps in fighting against uh, STGV and um, I mean, uh, sexual and gender-based violence. Looking forward to a fruitful discussion. And um, I would like to hand it over to my colleague and moderator, Isabella Wandi. Thank you so much, Karibun, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, very delighted to be with everyone this morning to have this very apt conversation and at this time where uh, we are at a time where we need to find more sustainable solutions if we are going to be having very candid conversations about issues of gender-based violence. Before we start off, uh, I would like to inform people that one, we are recording this session, kindly allow us. And number two, there is a, a list that my colleague Naima is going to be circulating. Kindly register using that link. And then lastly, um, please utilize the chat box to be able to let us know who is present and from where. Um, so yes, thank you. So uh, to set the tone, as, as the title suggested, is prevention the conversation we should be having in terms of looking for sustainable strategies or models that will end all forms of gender-based violence. As we are all aware, gender-based violence is an act that remains quite prevalent in this country. In the year 2020, especially uh, when the pandemic began, GBV was a shadow pandemic. And numbers spiked so high in the year 2020. And this was noted by the different toll-free numbers that are there for in both uh, national and CSO. Judiciary noted that, and the president himself noted it and came out to talk about it. To date, the situation has not improved. We still see every time or, 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 or more, more often than not, we are faced with news of issues of especially intimate partner violence or any other form of gender-based violence. And so it is time that we start having conversation and very candid conversation on how best can we then explore other avenues to be able to help us see a reduction of issues of gender-based violence. Better yet, what interventions or initiatives can we employ or utilize if we are to attain, as per the GF commitments, eradication of all forms of violence by the year 2026? And so today we are here to see if, um, to be able to answer the question, what next? We are doing a lot of prevention, a lot of investment has, has, I mean, a lot of response, a lot of investment has been put in response initiatives, yet the incidences of gender-based violence are still quite high. And so as we continue having the discussions around GEF, where Kenya has made very bold commitments and very huge investments in regards to prevention and response of gender-based violence. 
And so today, colleagues, I am joined by a panel of experts who in one way or another have interacted or have uh, done initiatives and have been very intentional in making sure that prevention is the focus. And so we, the panel, my panelists today are going to help us unpack this conversation, unpack what prevention really means, what it looks like, and, and maybe persuade us if then it's a good cause for us guys then to start shifting our focus to prevention. And so I'll start us off. Our first panelist is Patricia Nudi. Patricia, you can wave so that people can know who is Patricia. Hi, everyone. I'm Patricia. Thanks. Patricia Nudi is an advocacy and policy specialist with over 10 years experience managing health advocacy projects, specifically in the fields of universal health care, sexual gender-based violence, and reproductive health rights, and she's a lawyer. Our second panelist is Halima Abdi. Halima, kindly um, say hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Halima Abdi from the State Department for Gender. I'm sorry you are not able to see my face because of uh, issues with the technology. I'm sorry for that. So Halima Abdi is uh, the is a deputy director at the gender department and acting director for anti-GBV directorate at the state department for gender under the Ministry of Public Service and Gender. And she has been in the gender space for over 10 years. Our next panelist is Zuhura, Zuhura Odiambo. Zuhura kindly, yes. So Zuhura is the founder and uh, CEO of New Revenue Solutions Africa. She, he, she has over 10 years experience as a communication director in various um, corporates, including Nation. She, and she's currently the chair of KEPSA, GBV and mental health subsector uh, group and very passionate about issues of gender-based violence, especially in the workspace. And lastly, we have Lina Digolo. Lina, we can wave or say hi. Morning, everyone. Um, nice to be here and looking forward to the discussions today. So Lina is a senior associate with Prevention Collaboration Collaborative. She has over 15 years experience as a pediatrician, public health specialist and epidemiologist with technical expertise in policy making, system strengthening, research and service delivery. And so colleagues, as you can see, we have a panelist that um, will then be able to steer us off in this conversation. And I would urge you to listen if you have a question, kindly utilize the chat box. And at the end, we'll be able to, we'll want to maximize on the time to be able to listen to what the panelists have. And then we'll have a QA and a session where you'll have an opportunity either to write your question at the chat box or ask any of the panelists. And then we shall wrap it up by having a summary from our rapporteur who is present with us today. So without much ado, I would like to start us off with the first question. And this goes to all the panelists. What is prevention in the view of each sector, in the view of private sector, in the view of civil society, in the view of state department? And then lastly, Lina, you'll also give us the theoretic part of what or how do you define prevention? We'll start off with uh, Patricia. Okay, thank you so much, Isabella, and hi, everyone. Uh, for me, prevention and coming from the civil society place, uh, space, uh, we recognize that GBV is rooted in gender equality, serious gender inequalities. And so uh, prevention for me is looking at the root causes of violence and uh, addressing them uh, uh, either by stopping or reducing uh, before it even begins. So there's that aspect of being proactive about uh, violence uh, so that we do not wait to respond uh, to violence. And this can be done through uh, 
women empowerment programs. It can be done through uh, community sensitizations and dialogues and just ensuring that the community is in the same space when it comes to zero tolerance for violence. Uh, and, and that is uh, a space where the civil society have been very active. Uh, there's also the part where uh, we uh, advocate for a reduction in, uh, in repeat experiences. So that is also the part of prevention uh, that uh, the civil society also engages in. And so, for example, in cases where someone has been violated, there is need for them to be taken to a safe house, uh, where uh, someone has been uh, violated, they need to be taken to a healthcare provider so that the, the violence does not then uh, give birth to other aspects of, uh, of repeat violence as well. So we, we, we also really much engage in that space. And lastly, it's uh, uh, strategies that are aimed at um, uh, just preventing the long-term effects of violence. And, and uh, part of it is things like psychosocial support uh, that we, we look at to ensure that uh, then we do not really uh, uh, put the survivor in a space where uh, the long-term effects of that violence uh, then prevents them from uh, living a normal life, uh, uh, normal in quotes. And so for us uh, as civil society organization, we look at uh, prevention from these, uh, those three angles. Thank you, back to Isabella. Thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, Zuhura, you're next. Oh, sorry, I've done muted. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Isabella. And of course, uh, the rest of the team uh, putting this initiative together and bringing out conversations on uh, definitely being able to bring the prevention models for a sustainable strategy in all forms of gender. Of course, as private sector, and you can see how we are now blowing the tooth in reference to bringing this conversation into the organizations, which has not been done yesterday. And, 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 and we've been thinking in all different aspects. Anytime we talked about GBV, it looked like it was somebody else to be dealt with <laughs> and nothing to do with um, bringing this into the organizations, into the private sector, and even ensuring that we are making organizations inculcate different policies that would definitely be able to support this particular kind of initiatives. And our bigger part around it as private sector, of course, you know, from the private sector aspect, we are an apex body for the private sector of Kenya. And of course, we bring in local and foreign bodies associations, uh, of course, that are together. And of course, heavy enough, again, the SMEs and the MSMEs that are now every day ensuring that how are we able to change the economic landscape for this country. The bigger part of it and where we stand in heavily as a private sector is ensuring that we are bringing under the prevention umbrella is of course the uh, women empowerment. Uh, ensuring that, you know, uh, in every other aspect, how are we ensuring that somebody can vent for themselves? Somebody's not relying on somebody else, uh, whichever gender it is. I mean, how can we strive businesses to be able to do well? And with that, it enables them to make decisions. We've also looked at some of the findings that have been found out, which have been uh, reasons why uh, people tolerate and even um, are able not to know how to deal with uh, different um gender-based violence uh, aspect. It's because they, they just do not have any empowerment economically. Uh, so you will sit in and you know, you'd know you wait and uh, you'd sit in and continue taking it on and there's never been an address. So it's key for us as private sector representing the larger private sector, the SMEs, the MSMEs. Now we are seeing how these conversations can be rooted and even ensuring that we're bringing this kind of conversation into the boards and bringing this conversation into the policy uh, papers that are actually being put in organizations that everybody is tending to understand that. But better still, ensuring we're bringing in uh, more strategies around the, the, the women empowerment, ensuring that there's a, a good equality aspect happening across board, uh, whether it's on positions, whether it's on employment, whether it's on promotion, whether it's also on other issues that are touching on, on um, maternal health care and that. And because we will then be able to bring that, we are equipping, we are empowering this particular uh, gender aspect uh, to ensure that at no particular point do I have reason 
that I cannot make one particular uh, decision because I've been held onto somebody. So of course, we uh, as private sector uh, have looked at ensuring that we are bringing in the whole uh, women empowerment angle and also bringing in the gender empowerment in ensuring that, and these conversations are also live in that particular context and ensuring that uh, it is our day-to-day -day, everyday living that we are so conscious about uh, the GBV angle instead of it just looking like it was one of those items that are being handled by NGOs in, in uh, you know, whichever areas. <laughs> in fact, most of the times when we talk to some private sector, they're like, GBV, our place. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, okay, maybe we demystify. What does it mean? It didn't mean somebody was raped at the office. They keep thinking it's SGBV. And it's even how you talk about different things, conversations. Uh, when I was talking to a few talent managers, they all go like, you know, conversations that are there saying, oh, it was, uh, at least a woman feel has come into the department. What does that mean? I mean, <laughs> what was the woman feel, you know? And even aspects where you, you have interns who are feeling like they need to actually be uh, confirmed. And there are very many uh, aspects that are being asked for, for them to get a job. Did we know that is happening? Did you know about the emotional violence that is even happening to the senior women leaders and men as well? So hence the reason why we're thinking in the bigger part of giving them opportunity, uh, giving them a seat on the table, giving them a promotion opportunity, ensuring that we are equal in, 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 in positions and even recruitment. Uh, that enables us to prevent uh, a lot of the GBV aspect. Wow, thank you very much, Zuhura. Um, next will be Halima. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think for us, uh, uh, the meaning of the prevention, I know in the simple terms, prevention just means stopping uh, something from happening and is stopping something bad. Of course, it has to be bad. It's not something we don't always stop uh, good things from happening. So for government, uh, prevention of gender-based violence is ensuring that uh, ensuring the safety of all the citizens and ensuring that their rights are safeguarded, that there is no discrimination of whatever nature. And uh, you know, our constitution also, 2010 advocates for gender equality. So it is the responsibility of government to put in place laws, to put in place policies and uh, programs that are meant to prevent uh, violence and also to respond when uh, that violence happens. It's also the responsibility of government to uh, resource uh, programs for prevention and response uh, to gender-based violence and ensure that uh, there is equality among uh, all citizens in terms of uh, opportunities, as my colleagues have said, and I wouldn't want to uh, repeat. So that in short is just the meaning of prevention. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Abdi. Now, lastly, uh, Lina, you work in an organization that actually calls itself Preventive Collaborative. Uh, what is the theoretical part of what is prevention? How would you define prevention? And what are the types of preventions that are there? Welcome. Thanks, Isabella, and thanks to all the speakers who have gone ahead of me because they've made life very easy. I think the definition of pre pre prevention has been brought out quite clearly, and it's also very exciting to see how the different sectors are actually already are doing a lot of prevention work. Um, and I think the definition for me is very, very simple. I would define uh, prevention as preventing or pre violence prevention as stopping violence before it starts in those who are at risk of violence or stopping reoccurrence in those who've already experienced violence. So um, looking at it from those um, two aspects where there are already people, survivors undergoing, but you do not want a repeat event and also just making sure that we go to the um, so, should I call it source, but uh, where it starts and just stop the risk factors like you had um, Patricia mentioning, you know, thinking about the root causes and the risks and just preventing them from, from happening. So that's for me is a simple definition and the different um, speakers have already started speaking to what's been done. I think in regard to types, traditionally we've um, 
defined uh, prevention in three um, three categories. So there's primary prevention, and primary prevention is really the the first type that I said, reducing or stopping violence before it starts. And this is where we need to be having conversation around because um, this is where I think as a country, there's been a bit of um, um, areas that we could strengthen. So this is, is these are sort of types of interventions that are aimed uh, that are aimed at addressing the root causes that as we had of violence, changing the attitudes, behaviors, and the norms that actually drive violence. And, and, and looking at, the, you know, working with the communities, as you had the previous speaker say, working with them to understand these issues and working with them to help actually stop um, the violence um, before it starts. Examples are community mobilization programs and women empowerment programs that you've already had are ongoing. Then there's secondary prevention, and this is where Kenya gets an A. In terms of this is where we've put a lot of our investments, this is where most of our um, implementing partners are, are working. And here we have the response services really aimed at look finding those who are at risk. We have screening programs ongoing, but also when survivors come to us. And, and this is where we aim at stopping reoccurrence of the violence once we identify it e.g. the health, you know, what the Ministry of Health is doing through the health services, crisis counseling centers, shelters, uh, police. And then finally, we have the last one, which is the tertiary prevention. And this is aimed at preventing long-term disability. We know the impact of violence on, on, you know, mental health and other, you know, health um, issues, but even you know, social issues and economic issues, but this really look at preventing those long term effects. Example is long term counseling, which we know survivors require. So mental health treatments, um, things like access to legal and advocacy, like what Patricia and her team are doing, and perpetrator programs. Those are examples. So for me, those are three ways I could categorize uh, prevention, and that's the traditional way that it's been done. Over to you, um, Isabella. Thank you very much. And so to just summarize what all the panelists have actually echoed is that prevention is making sure that abuse does not start from the, from the onset. And then there are three types of prevention, which is primary, secondary, and tertiary. Now, my next question is, when you define prevention, it sounds uh, like something we need to have started doing 10 years ago. So uh, when or the, or 1992, when the women first went to Beijing, this is what they should, it sounds like they should have come up with. So why then do we need to prioritize or start focusing or change our shift to prevention uh, strategies and models? Of what benefit is it to us? And I think I'll start it off with uh, Zuhura. What are the benefits of prevention strategies and models? Um, thank you for that, uh, Isabel. Of course, um, the strategies of the prevention, um, uh, the prevention strategy and model and uh, how we would be able to look at it is being able to ensure that we are trying to, our bigger aspect of it is eradicating, of course, the whole GBV agenda, um, not to really, I mean, or lessening the cases. Uh, that we have seen that are upcoming, but it's also with a future focus of looking at what could have actually been the causes that uh, this actually gets to happen and how are we able to, you know, uh, be able to deal with it. Uh, and nevertheless, also the bigger part of even when it comes to our, our monitoring and evaluation of understanding how much uh, stride are we making? What are some of the things that we're doing and what is that that is disabling us? And, and, and it's with this, of course, that we've, and I liked the way uh, Lina broke it down to primary, secondary, and tertiary, that we were going uh, through it close to looking at, even with what we're doing currently at KEPSA, how are we able to ensure that we are, we are you know, we're bringing in the different models. For example, uh, we have, uh, we just to let all others know who haven't known KEPSA, of course, partnered with Belinda 
uh, uh, and Melinda Gates Foundation, and of course, to undertake the GBV advocacy program in the private sector. So the intervention is, uh, of course, our aim was creating the enabling environment for the elimination of GBV and scaling up, of course, the evidence-driven um, prevention programming and also accessibility of services for survivors through the private sector intervention. And uh, the better part of it is our good story about the 1196, which of course it's a toll free number that we have put in space and again that again goes i think that fits in at secondary right uh, secondary prevention where we have you see i can be a good teacher secondary prevention where now we it's happened to you we have our toll free numbers which of course we had put up during COVID, but it's the same toll free number that we have been getting a lot of uh, the GBV cases and in the private sector that are happening. And hence the reason why we then went in to do uh, our baseline uh, survey to be able to understand how many, uh, what's this data, because from that particular data, it will enable us make effective decision making around the GBV aspect in the private sector. So of course, um, each year, and not only that, uh, each year, of course, uh, we, uh, a GBV and mental health subcommittee was constituted, and that was in March this year, which I'm humbly enough to chair uh, with an able team and a tribe that is right behind me. And uh, the best part of it, again, that goes to tertiary in the context of all these people have gone through that. And I'm loving where realizing we, as KEPSA, we have actually gone through all the three definitions of that. And um, the subcommittee is, of course, responsible in coordinating and championing the GBV and mental health uh, management and uh, response in the private sector, especially in the midst of COVID pandemic that happened. But right now we see even from the economic landscape, and remember we've talked about KEPSA being the epicenter to be able to ensure we are helping to steer the economy to enable us handle this particular vice, uh, because when we empower various people. Now within that, we've seen people complaining about businesses, shutting down this and that. So what has happened, it's gone over also to the mental health. But other than that, even as a GBV vice, then definitely we are seeing how they, they, have, they, they have been affected in one or two things. So of course we are looking forward and uh, hopefully towards the last quarter, we'll be able to launch our, um, our findings, and it would be very nice to know what we have found around, especially being the first that is even um, uh, being done. But at the same time, the better part of it is um, how we even have our everyday, other than the policy, the data, the work we're doing, the sensitization, talking to different HR um, uh, talent managers and uh, board members and chairmen and CEOs to ensure that they are actually the ambassadors who are championing this. We are working every day with different people in the private sector, 24 hours through our uh, toll-free number, ensuring that we have people that can actually be able to help these particular people in the space of the private sector. Thank you very much, uh, Zuhura. Patricia? Why, why do we need to prioritize uh, prevention models? Why do, does civil society now need to shift the focus? Okay, so uh, for me, I believe that the fact that we are responding is a failure in itself. Uh, there is a need for us to uh, begin looking at prevention from the angle of it being a smart buy. At the end of the day, no one wins when uh, you go to rescue a, 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 a survivor who has to maybe live with disability and some have even passed on, uh, no one wins in that uh, kind of a, of a, of a response system. It, it is not uh, something, even if there is no physical sign that the violation happened, uh, these uh, uh, women, girls, and live with uh, the effects uh, of, of, of this violence for a very long time. So for me, prevention is a smart buy. Uh, prevention is, uh, for, for us, uh, should be a priority because one, it lessens the time uh, we take to respond to cases. Secondly, it's a smart buy economically. We do not have to spend so much money on on response because response is very expensive. Uh, and, and not only expensive in terms of finances, as I mentioned earlier, economically, psychologically, having to work with survivors of violence, it's very taxing. And even for them and their families, 
uh, it is very, very taxing for them to be able to uh, then uh, have to live with the effects of something they never really chose. And so for me, uh, uh, from a civil society perspective, I, I believe that efforts need to really uh, be put in to ensure that we prevent violence from happening and that we prioritize uh, the, the needs and the, and the girls' uh, uh, needs at the community level and sort out issues around gender inequality and, and, and engage the men in ensuring that they do not uh, view women as objects because that is normally uh, where violence really begins uh, when it comes to violence against women. And that we are talking about uh, these issues uh, from a point of looking for solutions even before they happen, rather than looking for solutions uh, that are, are responsive in nature. That is really my, my reaction. A smart buy, and uh, we would really save so much as a, as a community if we, if we uh, focused on prevention. Back to Isabella. Thank you. So for you, it's saving, saving, savings costs. Lina. Yeah, it's it's really nice to come in last always because um it makes my work easier. Everyone has already sort of alluded. No, you're not last. The see. state department. Has oh, not few. <laughs> so I'm just going to finish the points for 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 the last speaker. But um I think again um the the previous speakers have said that well. There's so many reasons why we should be preventing uh, violence. And I think um, this is the place where this consensus um, that no one wants violence to happen even from scratch. But I think I could summarize my, my, my reasons into, into four reasons. One is that violence is prevalent in the country. We know that through our routine data that we collect from programmatic, um, uh, from different programs. We've seen that in our population surveys, the KD, Kenya Demographic Health Survey, the Violence Against Children study that was um, published just last year, it's prevalent, particularly amongst women and young girls. So we have close to a third of women in the country and girls who are experiencing violence on a daily basis. That's, that's, that's worse than any uh, illness we know. So for me, that's the first reason why we should prevent it. We don't want it to have ha happen. And then the second reason for me is the impact that it has. And you've had the different speakers saying it has bad you know, um, health outcomes. So as we are trying to stop other health problems, mental health, if we don't um, give uh, attention to violence, we'll never succeed in the health sector. So. Um, um, of course, um, we need to come to the source. And the source is actually that there's violence happening and then going to that. But there's also the other impacts that we have in our social, you know, um, economic. And the economic impact is at national level, but also affects the women, their families, their communities, and society at large. So we just need to stop it. And then find, uh, the other reason why I think it's important is that we this good reason for response, particularly right now when we're in these unprecedented times of COVID, next year we're going into elections, we can't turn our eyes blind that we know that these situations increase violence within the homes particularly. So response is critical, but it shouldn't be a trade-off, either or. Even as we strengthen our response services, which we are doing a good job at, we should not um, let the prevention program suffer because the ideal thing is actually to prevent so that we don't have to respond. So for me, it's not either or, it's making sure that our policy documents, our um, program frameworks capture both and invest in both at, at, at the required amount. And of course, prevention is expensive, but the long-term impact is actually what we should be looking at. But the good news, my final thing is just good news. The good news is that we have prevention interventions that work. And we're going to be speaking about it. So in the past, we didn't know what to do, but now we know, we know, tested, tried, worked. So we actually have the answer. We just need to invest in it. Over to you, Isabella. And it is good you have ended on a high note because you started on a very uh, low note. So thank you for the good news. Halima, lastly. Why, why should the government start prioritizing on prevention mod models and strategies? Uh, thank you, Isabel. I think it is true that the government should start prioritizing uh, prevention uh, strategies to ensure that uh, nobody is violated against. Uh, number one for me, 
is about the cost. I know my other colleagues, other speakers before me have said it. There was a study that was done by uh, the NGEC uh, that found out that we spent 46 billion annually uh, on uh, GBV. This is quite a lot of money and this money could be put into good use instead of uh, using it to uh, treat uh, uh, gender-based violence uh, survivors. So the number one is about the cost, the cost, the cost, the cost. And then number two is about the health uh, issue of uh, the survivors. Remember somebody who has been violated will live with the scars uh, forever. That is something that somebody has to live with. And sometimes it actually affects, in most cases actually, it affects the life of somebody. Just think of that uh, small girl maybe who has been raped and uh, ends up not even getting married because uh, she fears uh, another ordeal by a man like that, uh, which may have happened before. So it affects somebody's life uh, forever. Uh, number three is still uh, related to health. I'm happy somebody has talked about the mental health. I think we have seen of late so many people commit suicide because of their mental uh, health. And most of these are just stemming out of uh, violence that has been uh, meted on them. So a nation, a nation with the people who are, let me not call them mad, but people who are psychologically uh, not well can be very, very costly to our economy. Uh, separation of families. Remember when uh, violence happens, families separate. And when they separate who suffers, it is the children that suffer. And when they suffer, then we know. Remember, we are dependent on our children for tomorrow's uh, leaders. So if they suffer today, then it means we don't have a nation uh, tomorrow to rely on. So I'm saying that uh, prevention is so key. Uh, the government has done a lot on uh, prevention and also a uh, response. We cannot say, because we are saying we do not want it to happen in the first place. It shouldn't happen. We should be able to prevent so that all these monies that we are spending in responding could be put into education uh, programs, could be put into health programs and other programs that uh, can actually empower our uh, women and girls. So I think uh, most of the, I don't want to repeat what my, my colleagues have said, I have them on paper, but uh, I think those are the few uh, issues that I can talk about now. Over to you, Isabel. Thank you very much, Halima. And I'm hoping participants have noted that across board, cost has been an issue, whether it is the cost of, of uh, GBV in terms of response or the cost that it would save us if our priorities were prevention based. And so Halima, the next question, I'll start off with you. As a state, what is currently happening in the country in terms of prevention models and strategies? Is there any ongoing activity that is purely prevention based that exists? Kindly uh, help us unpack that. Uh, thank you, Isabel. And I think the programs that are currently in place for government are mostly uh, both for prevention and uh, response. And I will explain so that we see the response part and the prevention part. Uh, the first one is uh, we have our toll free uh, helpline. 1195, that is operated uh, jointly by uh, the State Department for Gender and Healthcare Assistance, Kenya. It is a referral pathway that uh, assists uh, survivors to access uh, GBV services. Through the helpline, we offer counseling, we refer survivors to healthcare facilities, we refer survivors to the police, for legal aid, uh, to safe spaces, and even for uh, empowerment programs. I say this is a, both a prevention and response because uh, when we uh, sensitize people on uh, this toll-free helpline, we are actually telling people to report uh, GBV even before it happens. And if these uh, reports are, are made before they happen, then uh, this line will always uh, refer, maybe police, if somebody calls from uh, one corner of the country to say uh, there's a violence that is uh, just bound to happen, and the police get there on time, then we are saying that one will have a prevented uh, 
this uh, violence from happening. Uh, number two, what the government is doing is a coordination of uh, the national uh, GBV subsector working group. And this is a group that uh, brings together all the state and non-state actors, the civil society organizations, the private sector, the UN agencies, everyone is on board. All those who are working in the gender space are on board. And uh, we have also replicated this in our counties. And we have been strengthening uh, these working groups within our counties. And the work of these counties is actually to plan together and to resource for programs for both prevention, prevention and response. We say prevention and response because if we say prevention alone, what about what has already happened? So we must uh, try to prevent at the same time respond to what has happened. So this team is uh, available, is uh, present in all our counties. Of course, there are those who have gone ahead who are much ahead of uh, the others, but uh, as government, we are still continuing to strengthen those that have been formed uh, more uh, recently. And what these people do is that they actually advocate for peace. We also have the peace and security group that will advocate for peace within our communities, those communities that are always uh, maybe fighting over pasture, fighting over water and all that, cattle rustling and the rest. So they are actually advocating for peace and advocating for nonviolence within our communities. We are actually having uh, dialogues these, these, these particular groups conduct uh, dialogues with communities to engage the men and the boys and the Morans to ensure that we stop uh, violence within our communities. Remember our men, our men, our Morans are the custodians of our culture. Our culture or our country, our nation at large is still a patriarchal uh, society. And it is the men who are the custodians of this culture. So we have uh, decided that we should not be talking to ourselves as women. We need to talk to the people who actually uh, met violence against us as women. We need to go back to them. We need to talk to them and they need to listen to us and they need to work with us for us to end uh, gender-based violence. Because if that does not happen, then we shall continue to talk and talk and it will never end. So that is a strategy that the government has put in place for now and we're actually working on it. Another one is about uh, our duty bearers. Remember our duty bearers right from the commissioners down to the chiefs. Those are the people who are actually uh, supposed to prevent violence. But sometimes you realize that uh, they are still, some of them are still the same people who are meeting this violence on our children. For example, recently we have, we've had many cases about uh, chiefs uh, raping uh, young girls at the community level. And when it happens, where then do you report? So we are actually strengthening the capacity of this uh, group, these duty bearers to ensure that they understand their role and to know what they are supposed to do at the community level, that it is their responsibility to actually not be the ones causing a violence, but they are the ones to be actually preventing this violence from happening. So there has been, there have been engagements at the regional level and uh, that began uh, some time back last year and we believe that we shall continue to strengthen this. And once we do that, we shall see a change from our, our communities. Another initiative that uh, we are doing is about uh, the cross-border. Remember, we have FGM, which is one of the worst uh, violations of uh, human rights happening here in Kenya. And uh, now it is uh, changing forms. Every day we wake up and we wake up to a different uh, idea of how it is happening. Now we are having the uh, medicalization of FGM, which uh, if we are not careful, no one will ever know it is happening, where people collaborate uh, with the medical uh, personnel to ensure that this, this is done within a hospital and you just recover just like any other normal uh, uh, disease. Others are moving and crossing uh, our borders to ensure that they escape the law, that they are not uh, caught up with. So they cross over to Tanzania, over to Uganda, over to Ethiopia. So we have an initiative to end this cross border and we have signed an MOU with the Uganda, with the Tanzania, with Ethiopia. And I know it is a, we are currently in the stages of now uh, implementing the action plan that was prepared by uh, the five countries, including Somalia. Uh, another initiative that the government is doing is about uh, 
Uh, this GEF that uh, came to place just the other day with the commitments. Remember, we have the 12 uh, critical uh, commitments that are in place. The government has uh, gone ahead to actually uh, activate the committees that are working uh, in the counties. We have the GBV committees and we also have the FGM committees that are handling both uh, the, the, all the forms actually of uh, GBV. We normally stress the FGM because remember we have uh, that commitment to end this FGM by next year, that is 2022 in all the 22 uh, hotspot counties. And we are hoping and praying that this happens so that we shall now have uh, the other forms of uh, GBV uh, to deal with. We, another initiative that we have done is actually the use of the, of the media which is very important. We advocate for all this using the media and using mostly the vernacular radios. Vernacular in that uh, those who are at the far off uh, counties can be able to listen in their own language, in a language that they can understand. I know we have been talking in English, Kiswahili, and uh, we should not assume that uh, everybody understands. So once we give them in the language that they understand and it is being spoken by the people that they know, they are own. We always say they are own. They will always welcome the ideas uh, that they are being uh, given. And then, of course, the government is uh, doing a lot of empowerment programs. Remember the Wazo Fund, the Women Enterprise Fund, the GAF, uh, that is actually uh, being used to alleviate uh, poverty amongst our women and girls. Uh, remember, it is poverty that actually causes uh, GBV. It is the main, it is the main reason that uh, women and girls are experiencing uh, gender-based violence. And once uh, we empower these women, at least they will be able to chip in in even the, 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 the their domestic uh, uh, needs, and that will ensure that they do not undergo uh, a GBV in their homes. So uh, maybe I can stop there with those uh, few and uh, let the others give uh, more. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you very much, Halima. Patricia, what is happening in the civil society space in regards okay. to prevention strategies? Okay, thank you, uh, Halima, for that. And thank you, uh, Isabella. Uh, so for the civil society organization, we, we, we know very well that our work is to complement what the government does. And so most of what we do is basically on a complementary basis uh, with an, an... Patricia, you're on mute. I think we have lost her there for a minute. Okay. okay. Sorry, can you hear me now? I'm, I'm so sorry. Yes. Yeah, I think I had, I had quite a bit of a hitch. Uh, but uh, the work that we do is basically very complementary. And so uh, part of what civil society organizations have done. Is so we've had a lot of community dialogues and uh, community engagement and sensitization. And basically it's to just have conversations around uh, what the community would want uh, going forward. How do we address the gender inequalities uh, uh, that still exist within our communities, how to address power, the issues around power dynamics and having those conversations around why women need to be empowered and, and the link between empowerment, reduction of poverty and reduction of violence and, and mainstreaming these conversations within the community so that we are having them with our, our children, we are having them with the men in our lives, uh, the other women in our lives. And so our civil society organizations and Equality Now, KMET and others have really been engaged in, in this front just to ensure that we understand uh, the real issues at the community level, and then the community be, uh, comes up with their own homegrown solutions because the issue in one community might be very different from the issue in another community. And so that is something that we've really been uh, engaging in. The other part is on policy advocacy. And, and basically uh, there's uh, the phrase that goes that Kenya has so many laws, it's, uh, the problem is with implementation. And so uh, as civil society organizations, we've really pushed for implementation of the available laws, including uh, laws that are really just punish offenders, because that is also one of the strategies of ensuring that violence is prevented. Because if people see uh, people actually being punished for their offenses and, and, and people see the Sexual Offenses Act being implemented, then that also uh, acts as a deterrent uh, force in ensuring that 
we do not uh, see most of these cases going forward. And so uh, they are just uh, pushing for uh, implementation of the available policies, but also uh, being uh, proactive about advocating for more policies in that in the different uh, regions. And so, for example, uh, uh, the work that we've done has ensured that we have an SDBB policy in Kisumu. That is a work uh, with Equality Now uh, and KMET. And so these policies uh, sort of address uh, the strategies around how uh, the sector wants to work uh, on issues around uh, prevention and how we can then be able to uh, intentionally uh, begin to budget uh, for whatever is in the strategies within the uh, within the different counties. Uh, and that ties in very heavily with the financing bit of it. Uh, gender responsive budgeting. Civil society organizations have been really at the forefront of advocating for gender responsive budgeting. And, and so uh, this also will ensure that uh, we are intentional. As I said earlier, civil society comes to complement. So uh, the, the uh, we need to be very, uh, very proactive about ensuring that we invest uh, for some of these uh, features and the major investor in, in uh, some of these programs is the government. And so how do we ensure that we bring everyone on board, uh, the people who are uh, policy makers and the people who are budget holders and just to uh, uh, build a case for why GBV is uh, something that needs to be budgeted for. And that is also work the civil society has done a lot of. And lastly, on issues around accountability, we have been able to push for accountability, both at the state uh, uh, level, but also at the community level, because some of the greatest violations happen within the communities. And so how can we ensure that we work together to ensure that people are held accountable and that we are able to ensure that uh, state actors, even at the, at the community level, that is the chief uh, village admins uh, and, and everything, everyone that is, is, is a policy maker or a decision maker at any level, even at the grassroots level is held accountable. And also that in cases where there is gaps around knowledge, we have been able to also proactively engage in training uh, of state actors and, and capacity building. I, I know that's a word that has been overused, but just uh, trying to make sure that they understand the real issues and that they are allies in this, in this process. As I said earlier, we need government to be able to fight it. So those are some of the, of the work that we've done around prevention and that we continue to still do to ensure that uh, these cases are reduced or at the end of the day, one day we'll stop them. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, Patricia. And uh, indeed, you're right in saying that to civil society, all they do is complementing. And so if the national complement what government is doing, and so if that is lacking also in national, at the national status, then of course it will also not be very sufficient in our undertaking. You have sp spoken about gaps. Patricia, my next question, you will start us off. In the process of implementing the initiatives that you have uh, or civil society is undertaking in regards to prevention, what are some of the gaps you've been able to identify other than knowledge which you have already mentioned? In terms of programming and policies, are there any gaps that you have been able to identify? Okay, so I think I, may, I, I mentioned some earlier on. One is implementation of policies across board. There is a major gap uh, in terms of just implementing what we already have. Uh, we also do not really have, uh, uh, we, we have not really in our program design, we are more intensive. There's more, uh, more focus on uh, on pre on uh, response than it is prevention so it's very it's very difficult when you are even advocating for budget lines around prevention there is a lot uh, that has been left to civil society organizations and uh, and, and we are not very proactive. Investments generally go to things like construction, for example. So uh, uh, in Kisumu, for example, uh, there is a safe house that has been constructed. Uh, the safe house is not uh, running because now they, there is nothing that has been put aside to ensure that it, the day-to-day -day operation of that safe house becomes a reality. And we see a lot of that where uh, a, lot of, a lot of focus is there now 
uh, taken towards uh, just doing the hardware rather than the software. And as we know, and as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot uh, that needs to be done around even just changing of behaviors, changing of norms, changing of attitudes. How do we budget for that? How do we become more intentional about, about doing that? And there was also the part of financing. Uh, for me, I feel that we are heavily reliant on uh, on aid, and we are not really very intentional in doing uh, gender responsive budgeting as it is. Uh, we do not have data, uh, and it's very difficult to advocate in a space that data is scanty. And, and this is a space where, when, when I, I work in uh, the health space as well, it is very easy to get data around around health. It is very easy to get uh, uh, data because it, it's very structured and you know you go to DHIS, you will get the data. When it comes to the uh, GBV data, it's all over the place. And uh, for advocacy to really uh, bear fruit, you have to have some tangible evidence in place to ensure that you are able to uh, to then ensure that you advocate from a space of evidence uh, base, because that is the most effective way of advocating. I know NGC has been doing quite a bit, uh, and, and the government has been trying to come up with a system. Uh, the uptake, of course, is still something that needs to be improved. Uh, this coordination part of it, uh, the coordination is not very tight. Uh, in terms of ensuring that everyone is speaking to the other. It's, a, it's an area that really engages around different sectors. So we have the police, we have the health workers, uh, we have the government, everyone needs to speak to each other. But in most cases you find that uh, there is really no coordination. And so the multi-sectoral approach to dealing with violence needs to be uh, strengthened. And I mentioned uh, monitoring and evaluation as also something that uh, is a major, major gap when it comes to programming. And when it comes to policy, it's just issues around implementation, accountability, uh, and ensuring that uh, the laws that we have, even as we make more laws, we ensure that the ones that we have are being implemented. I, I've also seen that as a gap. And lastly, for me, there's a lot of rhetorics. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, we will do this and commitments. And commitments are good because commitments are what then jumpstarts the process of implementation. But for us, uh, part of it is we have seen that there's a, there's this over commitment and uh, nothing, uh, most of what is committed to is rarely, rarely sees the light of day. And so there is a need for us to then uh, uh, look at a political uh, commitments and try to translate those political commitments into action. And that requires a lot of advocacy. So I think there's still a lot to be done. Much has been done, but they still really work, much more work to be done in that space. Back to you. Thank you very much, Patricia Halima. Uh, responding to the same question, what are some of the gaps that exist in, as you implement the prevention strategies or programs you had mentioned earlier? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it is true. I think somebody has said that uh, it is true. We have the laws and policies uh, in our country, but uh, maybe the, the gap is on uh, implementation. And I say we have enough. Uh, we pride in these uh, policies and the laws. For example, we have the National Policy for Prevention and Response to Gender-Based Violence that is currently uh, being uh, reviewed. We have the National Policy for Eradication of FGM of 2019. We have the county government's policy on GBV of 2017. We do have the national guidelines on management of sexual violence of 2014 and the multisectoral standard operating procedures on management of sexual violence. Uh, on the laws, we also have the SOA, that is the Sexual Offenses Act, the Prohibition of Female Genital Mutilation Act, the Children's Act, the Penal Code, and um, Endless. We have quite enough. But the issue, the gap that exists is on implementation. But I am happy to report that uh, under the GEF commitments, uh, I think uh, the president committed to full implementation. It said full implementation. So I'm sure that once we start uh, rolling out the activities for uh, the GEF, we shall actually be able to uh, 
ensure that this uh, implementation of these existing laws, even before we start thinking of adding more, we first uh, work on what we already have. And maybe uh, in our next, maybe in the near future, we shall be reporting something different on implementation of laws. Uh, the other gap is uh, on funding of uh, GPV uh, programs and activities. I know uh, the civil society has been uh, complimenting what the government is doing, but there has never been enough in terms of uh, uh, resources. Again, there is a commitment within the GEF of uh, quite a huge uh, amount of money that will be put in place for our GBV activities. So we don't want to start reporting on it because it is yet to begin, but we shall still uh, continue to uh, ask our civil society and uh, the private sector to continue uh, complementing that. Uh, my other speaker spoke about the data and it is true, uh, different actors collecting data are working in silos. And what we receive is that uh, the, the very, very little or the scanty data that we receive cannot inform our programming or cannot inform any policy interventions. So there is need for a central repository where everyone collecting data can be able to channel that to one place to be stored and to be used to inform uh, our programming. It is not good to report as a, a let me use as company A, company B, you have little here, little there, it will never, never uh, assist anybody. It is good to always have uh, data that can be said that this is now what is happening on the ground because the data we are currently using cannot is, it does not reflect in any way what is happening uh, in the country. So there is need and I know there is work that is going on uh, to ensure that we have one uh, repository to collect uh, this uh, data. And the other gap here is about uh, duplication of uh, programs. And this mostly maybe I will be talking to the civil society because sometimes you find that uh, we have, we do have 47 counties in this country, but then uh, you will find that most people or most uh, CSOs could be doing uh, the same thing separately in the same county. So I would urge that even whenever uh, you are putting in your programs or your activities, or before you even start to say that we shall be working in this and that county, it would always be good for you to uh, liaise with the State Department of Gender to get to know whether there is somebody who is already putting in programs in County A where you want to go. So that we ensure that we actually uh, do our programs for GBV in the entire uh, country in all the 47 counties so that ca some counties do not get the benefit of having all the CSOs working uh, there while others uh, do not have. Uh, the other issue is about uh, knowledge, which uh, my other uh, colleague uh, talked about, lack of knowledge even by our own communities. Some people do not know what GBV is. They don't understand because uh, GBV has been normalized in our communities. So when it happens, they may never know that this is a violence being meted against me. So they keep quiet about it. So it is good uh, to strengthen our sensitization in our communities to let them know and to know that there's a, a place where they can uh, report uh, GBV. People do not know about the lines we are talking about. We know we have so many lines who are assisting survivors of GBV, but people do not know. So it is good for them to get to know so that they can be able to report. And once they report, uh, those uh, uh, numbers will assist us in uh, taking our programs to where they are most uh, needed. Uh, and of course, what we have always talked about is our, our cultural practices, our deeply rooted uh, cultural practices and this one we have said that uh, it is only dialogues. Dialogues will work effectively if we employ that uh, within our communities. We want to talk to them and uh, talk to them in a language that they can understand and let them uh, offer solutions to these uh, problems that are happening in their society. Uh, the other issue uh, is what I had mentioned before, the cross-border and uh, the medicalization and even uh, those people who are practicing uh, FGM. We are even now, it is imagined that those communities who had stopped some time back are now back to it. 
there are certain communities who are now going back to FGM and uh, those undergoing the cut are not just young girls, but old women who now feel that this is our culture and because it was not done to us, we want to start doing it. So there is need for uh, civil society, the government, the state and the non-state to work together to ensure that we actually uh, nip this in the bud before uh, next year. And then maybe uh, last one is about, uh, there are also security issues. I know in the Northern part of this country, we are experiencing security issues. And sometimes we fail to, to put uh, our programs in those counties because of our own safety of the people who are moving on from here. But the good thing is when we have uh, these uh, county uh, working groups and when we strengthen them, they are able to work uh, within uh, their county. So it is something that we shall be needing to work together to ensure that uh, we strengthen uh, those uh, groups that are working in uh, those counties. So uh, that is all for now, Isabel. Thank you very much, um, Halima. And lastly, Lina, I know you've done quite, quite a bit of research in regards to prevention within the country and outside the region. What are some of the gaps you have been able to identify? Yeah, thanks, Isabella. I think um, the, as, as you've heard from the previous speakers, we, 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 the country has done a lot of work in regards to GBV in general, um, and particularly um, the secondary and tertiary um, prevention um, um, interventions. I think where there's uh, work um, that's um, where we need to do work is the primary prevention um, interventions. And that's where I'll focus in terms of the gaps that I'll be mentioning right now will be around our, our, our primary prevention interventions. And I'll look at them in two ways. I've just recently, I think together with crew and, and equality, equality now, we talked to various um, partners at national level, at county levels, um, um, various implementing partners to try and understand the gaps within the policy and, and, and program um, level particularly around primary prevention. And I'll just summarize those in, in a few um, um, points. So at policy level, what came out glaring, as you've heard, we have as a country, a robust we have robust legal frameworks. If you started counting our laws and people even borrow them, those laws are very clear in regard to what we need to do in terms of protection and prevention of GBV. However, what came out quite clearly is that this does not translate into our policies. So you'll find that our policies would mention, yes, prevention, but even how the prevention was defined was not standardized. And then that was not unpacked beyond just a mention or maybe a paragraph or a page within the policy documents. The, 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 the response intervention would then um, take up um, the, the policy and that would be very clear when it came to implementation. So you even as we spoke, spoke to the county level teams and the CSOs in regard to what do you do in regard to primary prevention, what was mentioned more was um, um, uh, response interventions and long-term protections of survivors. As I mentioned, that's critical. But then um, we need to then think about, even in our conversations, be very deliberate to think about, are we going back to the source? So that was the first thing, lack of translation of our laws to our policies and our programs. I think the other thing that was quite clear at policy level was the financing. We didn't have any ring-fenced financing for prevention. The good news right now is that our GEF uh, commitments really just teased our prevention, and we hope that um, as, even as we continue to invest in response, we will have a very clear framework that defines how we will be able to um, resource the pre primary prevention interventions. We didn't have that coming out clearly when you looked at, you know, and spoke to the policymakers and the strategic planners. There was no commit money commitment from the various ports, even, even from CSOs to primary prevention. And where it was, where there was, it was mainly donor driven, as, as you heard Patricia saying. So we need to see some of that commitment from the from the from the um, government. And that's particularly for primary prevention. And then uh, we had um, a glaring um, gap 
at national level in terms of lack of uh, implementation framework? How do what, what do we even know as a country what strategies we want, prevention strategies we want to take forward, and then giving guidance on how this can be done, how various um, strategies that have been, you know, evidence-based strategies can be adapted locally, can be tested, can be evaluated. We have no framework that really unpacks that prevention um, strategy at national level. So that means that even at county level, everyone is doing what, what they think is appropriate for them. And, and another thing is that our, our strategies at county levels are not driven by the root causes or the drivers of, of violence at that level. So people come, donors have money, fund a strategy, but we don't start from the point of thinking about our theory of change, what's actually causing violence in this region, how do we design programs or adapt programs that are really, uh, so, so I think that this, the source comes from lack of that national level um, uh, guidance. And, and right now is optimal because the country is actually revising the GBV policy and response, um, um, the, the, um, policy, the, the GBV prevention and response policy. So this is the time we need to take a step back and ask ourselves, have we adequately looked at the prevention section? Because you'll find that um, sometimes these policy documents then um, don't unpack one section and what will happen is that we'll have the rest. So, so that's one. And then there's just also still areas that we can strengthen in terms of coordination. You've heard that when it comes to prevention, various sectors are involved. And so how is that coordinated so that we, we have the, you know, um, the response as one continuum, as opposed to siloed, you know, um, prevention interventions being done in small, um, small and parallel uh, programs, which might not give impact at national level. And then finally, at national level, we also need to strengthen our ME uh, frameworks and our, our HMIS systems to be able to collect data for prevention. So currently, the country is collecting very good data for response up to the, um, the H DHIS um, system. And we can find out whenever we want how many survivors um, uh, have undergone violence. Or, but we don't have any data going up to from counties to the national level in regard to response. So those are some of the things that at national level need to be taken into consideration. And this money that we have right now, thinking about how we make sure we can direct it to be able to strengthen that, starting from from strengthening our policy um, guidance as we develop them now. For quickly on, 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 on programmatic gaps is just advising the CSOs, start from your theory of change, think about the risks, think about the root um, factors. That was a gap in regard to programs. Also, um, whenever we get donor funding, coming to the organizations, there was that blanket implementation. So you pick a strategy and just roll it out as it was implemented, maybe in Uganda or in South Africa without thinking about the local context. So adaptation is really key. And then um, again, from the CSO level, making sure that within the programs, we have very robust m &E frameworks to help monitor this. So those are the, some of the gaps that came out. Thank you very much, Lina. And guys, I'd like to direct your attention to the chat where my colleague Naima is asking for people to utilize the link she has, she has shared for registration purposes. Um, the next question will be directed to Lina, and I think she's going to share her screen. With all the, you did mention prior that the things we are calling prevention models, uh, they are being called as such because there have been a lot of research. And so there's also a lot of evidence. And that's why they're being called prevention evidence, uh, prevention models. Uh, what exists globally in terms of, uh, or regionally in terms of prevention, where it, has been, where it has been tried and tested and the documentation has included, there has been reduction of uh, GBV. And as you respond that, please also mention um, the key things we need to put into consideration as we try to rethink the prevention models that are currently in country, how best to improve them. Thank you. 
thanks Isabella if I could be given host rights so that I can I can share but as we do that I can just speak to it um I think we've uh, I've mentioned it um before that there's good news there's so much evidence that there's there's been over 75 impact studies within Africa a high impact studies RCTs of 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 interventions that work to reduce prevention interventions. I mean, pre um, violence, uh, uh, violence amongst women, and violence amongst girls, and violence in general. So we have, we have, we have evidence of of interventions that work. So that's a good place to start. Uh, and 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 we also now have guidance at the inter global level. WHO has 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 released um, new guidance on prevention, in particular for violence against women. We have the respect framework for violence against children we have the inspire framework that really shows and has brought together a compendium of what could work as particularly in the global south interventions that countries can adapt so um so so that's a good point to start as and kenya has always been known to really um take up guidance um, and use who guidance to inform their policy so as a country even as we now commit funding to this we need to think about so what are these interventions that work i'm going to just show you one slide that i put together to 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 do this i'm so, oh, sorry i don't know how to can you see the slide Is my slide visible? Sorry, could yes, I? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, it's visible. Though, is so, there a way you can zoom out a bit? Yeah. Okay. So, so this is just a slide to to summarize. Uh, this is a lot, a mouth a mouthful, but just to show you the respect strategies, and I'm showing with my casa the respect is actually a, a, a prevention um, guidance from WHO that uh, has brought out seven strategies that have been shown to work in regard to violence prevention and it's actually an acronym with r standing for relationship skills as one of the strategies and then e as empowerment of women as a strategy that has worked services ensured um, poverty reduced as a strategy environments made safe um, child adolescence and abuse prevented and transformed attitudes, belief, and norms. And, and some of you might wonder why child adolescence and abuse is here in a, uh, in a, in a, in a strat, in a, as a strategy to prevent violence against women and children. I mean, why violence against women? And right now, what's been pushed for, and there's so much evidence showing that you can't delink those two forms of violence, violence against women and children and violence against uh, violence against women and girls and violence against children co-occur. They occur in the same homes, in the same spaces. So it just makes sense to, to as you're thinking about a national program, to make sure that at some point you integrate the two. So um, just quickly because of time, you can see there are those seven strategies and what I have actually put on the final row is to show you that there are programs and I just chose programs in, re in countries that are with similar contexts to Kenya. So most of them are from our neighborhood countries. So like for relationship skills, we have a very good program, pre primary prevention program in the Shikira, which was implemented, tested and tried in Rwanda and led to a reduction of intimate partner violence in particular within homes. Uh, we have stepping stones that many of you have heard of. It's even in, been implemented in Kenya as we speak. And so this is an intervention that has worked within the community to, to reduce violence. Um, we've had so many of our speakers speaking as women, empowerment of women as a strategy to reduce violence. Kenya has done very well in this. In fact, one of the strategies mentioned in the WHO guidelines is from Kenya, Adolescent Girl Initiative. We have other example, another example from Tanzania called Maisha. So as a country, even as we think of strengthening our strategies, we already need to think about what we are already doing. We're already doing women economic empowerment we should straighten that, put, in, it, put it in into our policy documents as strategies and resource for it. And then services ensured, remember I told you, response is still a, a, a prevention strategy. And this is where Kenya is doing well. We have you know, shelters, we have helplines, we have one-stop crisis centers. Um, another one that has been shown to work is alcohol misuse and prevention interventions, because we know in spaces where especially men drink a lot, this has effects on 
um, of increases uh, uh, partner violence. And so what I've listed here are the examples of programs that were listed in the WHO guidelines, but we also know that we have this in country. So the question is, what did these programs do for them to really be tested, tried and succeed? We don't have to go and pick them. We just need to look at them and see we need to strengthen is ours okay if ours is okay let's evaluate it so that the next time we also can share our work with other countries so this is where kenya is really doing well and then strategies to reduce poverty have also been shown and this is through cash transfers which we also have a lot in country or other in-kind transfers and we saw a lot of this happening during the corona period we hope that can be sustained as a lesson learned i know mombasa did a very good job nairobi also had this various countries actually county governments actually committed funding to cash transfers to to women who are either at risk or undergoing violence and then we have school interventions very good examples even from kenya um, we have this uh, i think a skillful parenting pro program that's been done in kenya and has been tested and tried successfully to reduce violence against adolescent girls particularly and, and, and other children. So there's environment made safe and if we have the UN team here, they can tell you they are really committed into in, in their safe uh, UN safe uh, cities um, program and this has been shown to work with good um, um, outcomes and so just expanding that as a country could could help us. And then we have the violence against children program and the country has put in a lot of effort in this. I know the country right now is putting in effort in um, strengthening the parenting program at national level. And we know this is a very good strategy to reduce both violence against women and violence against women and children within homes. And then one key thing that we really need to think about uh, in, as a country is how to transform attitudes, beliefs, and norms at community level. So programs that really work on this like stepping zones, SASA, uh, in the Shakirwa, Sasa and Stepping Stones are already been done in country, but this is just to show you if we decided as a country that we want to learn from others, there's a whole list of programs that we can actually borrow from. So these are examples of strategies that have been found to work as we think through our prevention strategies, as we develop our national guidance, how do we make sure that we adopt in some of these strategies, and even thinking about what's already happening in Kenya, because a lot is already happening, so that we can do that at scale, as opposed to doing it in small communities and not being able to see the impact at large. Thanks so much, Isabella. Also, you, I don't know if you asked a second question. I, I can't remember what the second question was. I did ask you to just highlight uh, what would be some of the things would maybe you want to take into consideration, but I think you've sort of mentioned it as you are doing your presentation. Okay. All right. All right, thank you very much, uh, Lina, for that. Um, <clears throat> Zuhura, I don't know whether you're still on the call. Uh, yes, I am. Good, now. Uh, being the private sector, um, I am sure you are aware of the GF commitments that the government um, pronounced or declared, which were very bold and they even attached a huge investment to some of these uh, commitments. And so I think my question to you as a private sector, what role will you play uh, or how are you going to support to ensure that the GF commitments come to fruition? And more so, most importantly, that the prevention is going to be at the forefront. Uh, thanks, Isabella. Of course, um, as a member of uh, the National Steering Committee under the GF uh, process, and that uh, KEPS has participated in a number of the national GF advocacy convenings, and with the aim of uh, solidifying and raising awareness on our commitment and also promoting the gender equality in the private sector. Uh, so far, we have uh, participated in various um, advocacy convenings, um, such as the GF Kenyan chapter. And it's e exciting to note that the Kenyan government through the presidency, of course, has made amb ambitious commitments and such a strengthening, of course, the GBV and also enforcement of the GBV laws and policies. 
uh, amazing how, of course, you've seen how um, the president has also ensured that he has uh, put it down that the private sector plays a big key role in ensuring that this actually is achieved. So, of course, in order to complement the joint efforts of uh, Generation Equality Forum in Kenya and also uh, as a member of the GBV Action Coalition, uh, as Kenya private sector, we have our commitments that we have put down that we will anchor this particular messaging. And one of them is enhancing the private sector participation in the national level uh, consultations and also in the GBV Action Coalition aimed at ending all forms of GBV, including harmful traditional practices. Uh, the other part of it, uh, which is our key commitment, is uh, strengthening the mobilization of the private sector actors uh, with an aim of enhancing collaborative efforts and also synergy towards eradication of GBV and other forms of violence against women, men, boys and girls. Uh, the other part of it also is, um, is in the development and private sector position paper uh, to provide a blueprint of uh, championing um, the policy recommendation on management of on response on GBV in the in the sector, and uh, we also have the implementation uh, advocacy uh, on the strategies that seek to ensure the implementation of gender related laws such as the C one hundred and ninety Violence of Harassment Convention uh, twenty nineteen after ratification, and of course, and policy commitments such as the anti sexual harassment. And of course, the protection against uh, sexual exploitation and abuse um, policies in the private sector. We go strong by also committing further on the strengthening coordination, monitoring, and documentation of GBV cases in the private sector. And hence the reason why, and I, I, I like the bigger part of uh, where we are talking of uh, the multisectoral approach, also ensuring that how are we handling this, how are they protected? Do we see cases where people have actually um, reported particular cases and thereafter uh, they either let go at work because of the one or two, and even who then is having this particular information? How are they, How what are the policies that are governing that? So we are looking at uh, ensuring that we work very well on the coordination, monitoring, and the documentation. And again, takes us back to the data, which is one of the bigger gaps that, of course, we've seen, again, in the private sector. Uh, the best part about it, and having dealt with, you know, um, a various aspects of data, data is available. There's also primary data that has been there before. Uh, there's a lot of people who have. I, I, I am humbled enough to serve on the Shofco board, and we've seen also how uh, we have got our GBV center at the Shofco. There's enough data that is whatever happening, and together with other people that are that are busy uh, enabling and helping fight the GBV vice. But my question, and even that's what you brought into the private sector, is in the data, how have we been able to interrogate uh, integrate the particular data that we're getting. This is from private sector. And of course, even as we deal with private sector, despite across from the MSMEs and us, they are the same cases that you find. Um, it's whether where people are staying and various things that are happening, but they also work for us and they've got little businesses on that. Where are we taking this data on the aspect of warehousing, integrating it, combining it on the technical aspect to ensuring that even as it's being warehoused, uh, where, where is the re repository um, system for this, where organizations can access this particular data. We're talking of government, we're talking of what's happening at county, we're talking of what's happening in the national government. But if we can be able to bring that, and yes, it's not only private, but again, we've got all other aspects of data that would come in, but looking at the private focus and even being able to work on the analytics element of it where, uh, we are examining the different data and with, of course, the bigger goal of, you know, setting the goal of uh, being able to help us make better decisions, plan better. We are seeing a bigger gap around um, the private sector uh, on various uh, lack of de designated budget on the private sector. You talk about gender and they're talking about this particular budget to be put in that we are not having that conversation to be a normal conversation uh, in, in any of the private companies. Again, we have our commitment around creating awareness among the private sector 
actors on generation equality, and of course, uh, the Equality Forum with an aim of mobilizing, and uh, also the collective advocacy campaign um, with the influential sector decision makers to speak with one voice in eradicating the GBV. So it's key that right now we are not shy to ensure that we're looking at it in the board matrix, we're looking at it in the exco, we're looking at it in the uh, HR policies, we're looking at it in ambassadors in organizations, being able to stand in. And we're also looking and using media to be able to demystify the whole aspect of GBV and the conversation not to look like it's any hidden secret. Then also the other part of it, uh, one of our key commitments around that is undertaking the periodic research on the trends of GBV and of course, strengthening the business cases, uh, investing in GBV programs uh, in the private sector. Uh, so you can see we are out to ensure that those are the commitments that we're putting out, but key enough, uh, there are gaps that still exist around it, uh, even in, in the adoption and implementation of the policies on the on gender, and even at the same time, even GBV prevention is yet to be inculcated in the organization management strategy. When they're talking about their strategic plan, at no point are you seeing any <laughs> gender element being introduced and even GBV being looked at. Because remember that the more we do not deal with it and when we deal with prevention, then the output for organizations, for them to even be profitable, uh, the input of employees who have been affected coming in, how much are they giving you? So you, you make losses or you just do not grow businesses. So when they start look at it, like it's one of the vices they would be worried about to be able to be inculcated in their management strategies and policies that are aligned to that and to be able to know that we are enabling, creating a GBV free enabling environment in the private sector. Thank you very much Zura for that. Patricia in, Patricia? Sorry, I was talking while on mute. Uh, Sorry for that. Okay. Yes. Uh, in two minutes, what a uh, civil society, how do we see we are going to ensure the actualization? As you had, had mentioned, commitments is one of the things the country is good at, but then it never comes to fruition. So what role are we going to play this time around, around the GF commitments? Okay, for me, I think we, we need to consistently have this discussion. We need to... Uh, not drop the ball at any given point. Uh, our conversations must uh, be centered around uh, the commitments and how we can be able to be part of uh, the solution in terms of ensuring that they actually see the, the, the uh, light of day. So that would mean accountability, but also a consistent advocacy so that uh, then we are able to always be at the forefront and, and the center of sensitizing even the other state actors who do not know about the commitments on, uh, on these commitments and to be able to also ensure that government uh, is able to uh, live through uh, the, uh, some of these commitments. So for us, it's uh, basically advocacy, uh, accountability uh, uh, initiatives and also just sensitization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Halima, what is the government um, doing or thinking of doing to ensure that the GF commitments will actually will be actualized? Uh, thank you, Isabel. Hi. I think now uh, these commitments were made uh, by the president of the Republic of Kenya and the lead ministry is uh, the Ministry of Public Service and Gender that is going to be coordinating the implementation of the uh, activities to actualize uh, these commitments. Uh, I'm excited to hear from the private sector, from the civil society that they are ready to work uh, with the government to ensure that we attain uh, uh, these commitments. For now, uh, we have already put in place the structures and one of the speakers has even spoken about being in one of the committees that have been uh, put in place from the National Advisory Committee, uh, the National Steering Committee and the County Coordinating Committees uh, and also a secretariat. All that is already in place. We also have uh, 
prepared a draft uh, uh, action plan for implementation of activities for achieving uh, these commitments. And I know that uh, just uh, before we were supposed to have been in a retreat for these uh, committees uh, early uh, this month, but because of uh, the surge in the numbers of uh, infections of uh, coronavirus in the country, that one was uh, put on hold. But I know that uh, we shall be having that meeting uh, very soon. And in that meeting, we shall be now agreeing on how we move with the implementation of uh, these activities. So what I can say is that the government is ready and just waiting uh, to move on and to roll out uh, these activities in all our 47 uh, counties. Of course, working together with uh, all the state and the non-state actors, including the private sector and the civil society organizations. So because there is a commitment for funding of these activities, there is a commitment. Of course, uh, the civil society also talked and I've said the commenting. I know they'll be putting in place also some uh, funding for uh, to support these activities. So we are very hopeful as government that uh, this is going to be done. We have uh, timelines. There are some that are for next year, 2022, and others will go up to uh, 2026. The commitment to fund uh, these programs will go up to 2026. So we know and we are almost sure that uh, this is going uh, to happen. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you very much, Halima. And um, just reading at the chat, Claire actually says implementation of this commitment should, should and must be community-centered. And so that's maybe something for all the four panelists to take home. And in one minute, last question, or rather I'll do a round in exactly one minute. What, what, is, your, what is your call to action? And I'm going to start with uh, Zuhura. Your call to action, what would you want either state or private sector or civil society to be able to do? in order for to achieve a GBV free environment. One minute. Uh, of course, my call to action is uh, the collaborative effect and even just starting with what we are doing right now, that it's no longer we can all work separately, but we are all seeing on how we can work together, work together, because it's it's the same, same particular agenda that we are all out to, to drive and we cannot do it alone and they cannot be able to do it alone. So we are looking at that particular multi-sectoral approach where we then are sure uh, that we can be reliable to each and every person. Uh, and also being able to see how we're making it easy for government to understand uh, the different dynamics in the private sector and also being able to see and align various policies that would govern the one or two, even just incentives uh, that we are hoping that one day government will say, uh, you know, there's this particular incentive for organizations that do A, B, C, D in reference to that. And you now see that it's easier for our conversion aspect from our side and even the support that comes in from the government. But nevertheless, we are hopeful and uh, very optimistic that we are going to make uh, the workplaces a GBV free zone. And uh, we are likely to see this effect come into place in the next three years. You'd likely to be able to have seen a lot of just uh, the change, changing that particular narrative because a lot has happened in the private space uh, we, we are happy, we are now very active around it, but there's a lot of the unspoken that has been, and even just demystifying that they are all different aspects of GBV and being able to see how we can inculcate these conversations all the way even to the educational fraternity uh, from primary school, from secondary school, so that in the generations to come, they are not going to go through the various things and the gaps that we have seen across. But nevertheless, steering and also celebrating, uh, in fact, as private sector, hopefully we'll be able to do some awarding onto organizations that have actually been able to put uh, the one and twos in place. I mean, we're looking at the likes of some of the private sector organizations like Safaricom. They've got their, their, they've got their gender 
the gender mainstreaming uh, aspect on the diversity and inclusion, the various aspects they had, even the various parts uh, during this particular COVID uh, that are dealing with the psychosocial support, working from home and various things that are happening across to their employees. Now, we are looking at how many other organizations will we be able to get around that particular aspect and have these conversations that are very clear. But nevertheless, also ensuring that we then are changing these narratives even with the media. We have seen the first media house that we worked with, which is one of our members, the Nation Media Group. They intentionally have a gender desk that they've created for all the gender issues, the gender reporting, the gender analysis. And this is what we are looking. How are we able to get our private sector helping us demystify this, carry this out and being able to rally on and be able to deal with this particular vice for gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you, Zuhura. Um, Patricia, kindly one minute, your call to action. My call to action is that we need to uh, ensure that there is implementation of uh, laws, the laws and commitments that uh, we have. Uh, we uh, even before we begin uh, brainstorming around new laws and new policies, there is just need for us to ensure that there is complete implementation and to not drop the ball on issues around uh, around uh, SGBV uh, around GBV. Uh, my other is that we streamline our data system so that it's uh, it, at a glance we can be able to see how we are doing as a country in terms of uh, gender-based violence. Thank you. Back to you, Isabella. Thank you, Patricia. Lina, your call to action. Um, um, Isabella and, and everyone else, I think for me it's very simple. We need to listen to the evidence. It's this overwhelming evidence that violence is preventable. So based on that, I think we need the government and other key stakeholders, their partners to invest in prevention interventions alongside the response initiatives. As a country, we need to really think about um, starting to um, institute a national framework for prevention. We already have frameworks for response that guides the partners or the counties to be able to select, adapt, um, monitor and evaluate and scale up evidence-based prevention interventions. Thank you. And uh, lastly, Halima. Uh, thank you, Isabel. Uh, before I take my one minute for the call to action, I uh, just want to clarify that the, the GBV policy that is currently being uh, revised or reviewed uh, has a detailed implementation uh, framework that is for the comfort of everybody that we shall have that showing the roles of each one of us uh, within this uh, room and uh, without this room. Uh, for my call to action, I think my number one call to action would be to strengthen our collaboration. I know the collaboration is there already, but we need to strengthen this collaboration because uh, my other presenters have said, no, no one of us can do it alone. Government cannot work on GBV uh, and end GBV alone. Civil society or the private cannot work alone and end uh, this vice. So we need to strengthen our collaboration, both the state and non-state actors to ensure that we work towards the same goal. And this will actually eventually lead us to ending uh, in our country, uh, Kenya. Number two is on the uh, community engagement. Let us involve our communities. Let us not just be at the county headquarters talking about GBV uh, issues. Let us go down to the roots. Let us go down to our people, to where the issues are, and let them be at the forefront in giving us solutions to how we can end uh, GBV in our country. And then of course, the last one is on, uh, I know we were discussing today, uh, prevention, 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 prevention. And it, because it is better for us to prevent than to cure, it is not as costly to prevent as curing. Let us strengthen also our prevention uh, mechanisms and let us work uh, together to do that. I think those three 
uh, my call to action. Over to you, Isabel. Uh, thank you very much, um, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. We have come to the end of the panel discussion. We are now opening this forum for questions for the Q&A session. Um, so if anyone has a question, kindly raise your hand. We'll be able to get an opportunity to talk. Uh, and also in the interest of time, let's also be very concise with our questioning. Uh, and as we wait for guys to raise their hands, the, we have four questions in the Q&A section. We have Tico Dennis, who is asking about the fact that we have the 1196 and the 1195 toll-free number. How then do we avoid double reporting? And his second question is, do you have psychosocial support system in place since it's very important to survivors? Um, I'll just read out the questions and then um, pan panelists kindly just note them so that you can be able to respond. Beatrice Kwamboka is saying, um, now that we have received commitments from the top leadership of our country on zero tolerance by 2020, which is really good. Uh, my question goes to Halima. The state, uh, has the president commitment trickled down into tangible programs or interventions by government or the relevant duty bearers? So Halima, that is your question, whether the GF commitments um, have managed to trickle down to the 47 counties um, and whether that information now is at the grassroots level. Then Consolata Waidaka, Wondering where the money promised by president for safe houses is. I think this is also a question for Halima. Pesa safe house Kowapi. And then Kate, what particular male engagement strategies did you look at in Kenya? I suppose this is a question towards uh, Lina. And then lastly, it's Muhammad Ali. How do you how do our prevention address the justice system? Thank you very much for those questions. Um, I think we'll start with the first one, Halima. How are we avoiding duplication of reporting? You're going to respond to Tito, you're going to respond to Beatrice, and you're also going to respond to Consolata in regards to the safe houses, as well as to Mohammed in addressing the justice system. The floor is yours, Halima Asante. Then Lina, you're going to respond to Kate. Uh, thank you, Isabel. Um, I think about the 1196 and 1195, uh, my colleague is uh, here also. She will be saying something on the 1196, but what is uh, important here is that uh, I think what we are doing now, just like the data that we talked about, that we have people working in silos, and uh, collecting data here and there, uh, which may not be able to really help. We also are currently working on uh, guidelines on uh, establishment and even management of these uh, helplines within our country. I know currently there are no guidelines and uh, people are just uh, operating uh, these uh, lines the way they know uh, best. And when we do that, we are actually even bound uh, to duplicate because someone will call 1196 and still call 1195 and is captured as uh, two different people, thereby giving us uh, numbers that are not uh, actually reflecting what is on the ground. So that one, I agree that uh, there can be duplication and we are currently working on how we can uh, harmonize the operation of uh, these uh, helplines. We are not saying we are going to have just one helpline, but uh, there is a way we can have uh, several helplines, but to give us uh, correct information from uh, those centers. Uh, uh, that one of has the uh, commitments uh, trickled down to uh, the communities. I think what I said before was that uh, we already have uh, structures in place. And we know that when these commitments were made, we already had uh, these county committees. 
So there was no need for us to start uh, different committees to work on uh, GEF commitments. So the agreement was that we were going to be uh, now sensitizing the teams that are on the ground on these uh, commitments. That one I can say has not happened. Remember I said we were to have a retreat uh, early this month. Why it not for the, the, the corona numbers that went up, we were supposed to discuss the rollout of uh, these uh, commitments at the counties. And I know that uh, we are going to be doing that. We are going to be involving those committees at the county level, and we are going to ensure that everybody is aware of uh, these commitments because we cannot achieve them at the national level only. Uh, number three, someone has asked uh, where money for the safe, safe houses they uh, went to. Uh, I know that uh, there was money that was given for support to the uh, government led uh, shelters. And what happened is that we were able to support the, the money that was given to the state department came uh, during the fourth quarter of the, the financial year. And that one was given to us and we were able to support uh, two safe houses, one in Migori County and another one in Nairobi, that is a Kayole Girls. It is still work in progress. The works that are be still being done uh, is still ongoing. And I know that uh, maybe uh, during this year, we shall be able to support uh, other, other safe houses uh, within the country. I know it is most of the safe houses currently being run are supported by uh, CSOs, but the government now is keen on uh, having those that are government-led to ensure that uh, the funding uh, is uh, sustainable. Over to you, uh, Isabel. Thank you very much, uh, Halima. Lina, you're next. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Isabella. I think for the study that we did, um, in regard to feedback on specific um, programs, we did not get, we were, our question was directly about what strategy are you using? And we didn't get into the in-depth of um, name, mentioning programs unless they were actually volunteered. So men engagement came out as a strategy that a number of partners said they were doing and, and saying that they, you know, how, how they do it through groups and going to the communities and looking for the men where they were. And then a few organizations mentioned like Men Engage. I think one program called some, I think Men Matters was mentioned, but we didn't get into specifics of the program, going into the detail of the program. I think this is something that can be a next phase of the study because here we were interested at strategy level. So that mm -hmm. came out as a very strong strategy in regard to something that's been implemented at community level, but we do, I don't have specifics in terms of names of the programs or, 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 or brands of the programs that worked. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. Then Christine Kandia is actually from Baringo, is saying that the 12 free numbers need to be made available in the rural areas. So current organizations that have 12 free numbers, the state crew, uh, kindly get in touch with Christine Kandia so that she's able to know how that can work in Baringo. Daisy Ochola, I think I'd seen your hand up. Daisy? Daisy, was your hand up? Okay. Do we have any questions from other than the ones that I've read? Any other questions? I think we have. Uh, we can take one last round of questions, maybe in two minutes, if there are any. All right. Um, Last call, any questions? All right, so colleagues, uh, I truly thank you very much for the engagement that I've been seeing going on at the, at the chat box as we were having the conversation with the panelists. Uh, we have noted points from Rosalind Mukabana uh, where she has actually highlighted the GBV management and control bill um, we have also noted uh, points from the other colleagues who 
stated that this issue of prevention, more so the GEF commitments need to be at the grassroots. Uh, Grace Ojuang uh, failed to make that it failed to make, we have seen some of your comments. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, in summary, this conversation was clearly very apt. And from the conversation that you have seen is that this is the right time to start the, this prevention conversation, to start and build on build up on it. Whatever is existing in country, it is time to assess it and see if there is an opportunity to adopt what is either within the region, putting into consideration the context of each county in regards to issues of gender-based violence. And definitely the time is now to start this conversation and not any other time. There is an issue of collaboration for this to be a success, as some of the panelists have pointed out. The, the issue of cost, the cost we are currently incurring to respond, and then the cost it will take to come up with a prevention model, cost and time. And so we'll need to be patient if we are to start a prevention models, but then for it to work, collaboration is going to be very key. We need not to work in silos. Uh, the GEF commitments, um, people are now more keen to be able, they are very good com commitments, which we see that they truly do endeavor to ensure that we have uh, all forms of GBV ending by 2026. But then for that to happen, this conversation has to trickle down to the grassroots. It cannot be a national level conversation that's only being done in certain major cities, but it has to trickle down. And then lastly, there's been, um, a call towards collaboration, collaboration across the board, across everything else. Uh, before we close, I've seen our executive director is here, Wangeshi Washira. Wangeshi, uh, kindly, if you can say a, a word or two before we close. Wangeshi, are you here? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wangeshi, where, are you there? Maybe raise your hand. Wangeshi, raise your hand so Dennis can be able to unmute you. Yeah, yes, Sire. Dennis, there is Wangeshi, kindly unmute. Um, thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you, Isabella. Sorry, I think the settings I wasn't able to unmute, but I really want to thank everyone for joining this conversation. I think this is the time to. Um, put our investment more on the prevention, response is important. But I think as, um, as uh, Lena was able to break down the prevention and the strategies that need to be put in place, I think this is a time as a country, we need to invest more on prevention because it has been seen, it has also been evaluated that uh, indeed prevention works. There are already models within the African region, which really warms my heart because when you look at what has happened in Rwanda, what has happened in Uganda, what has happened in South Africa, also what has happened here in Kenya, it's very clear that uh, the prevention models uh, work. Let's bring them home. We already have a national commitment from the head of state uh, under generation equality and investment have also been put there. I think Kenya is at a strategic place to be able to take up some of those models and ensure that um, they are implemented here. I think it will cost uh, less if we prevent more, uh, if we work more on prevention and really reduce the amount of resources that are put on, on uh, response. Because the way the world is going right now is looking at more on the prevention 
um, even as we look at uh, how to respond to cases that come along the way. So for me, it's really to thank each and every one of you uh, from the different parts of the country who are able to in here, I saw um, participation from uh, Nairobi, from Mombasa, Kilifi, Bomet, Narok. I mean, the counties were able, were really well represented. And I also want to thank our panelists uh, who joined this uh, conversation, Halima, all the way from the uh, Ministry of Gender, uh, Zuhura, uh, Kepsa, uh, Dr. Lina Digolo uh, joining us in this uh, conversation, but also um, thank our colleagues who've been able to put this together, Isabella, Marcy, uh, Dennis, Christine, and thank everyone for really uh, joining this uh, conversation. Let's put more resources investment on our prevention because it works and is possible to work even here in Kenya. Thank you, Isabella, and over to you. Thank you very much, Wangeshi. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, guys asking about uh, the report. Uh, we should be able to distribute the report once, once it's done. We're just finalizing on a few things. I uh, also would like to point out that we do intend as an organization to continue having webinars on prevention for purposes of enlightenment, learning, and seeing how best amongst ourselves we can be able to come up with strategies and interventions that are truly going to work for our communities. So I do wish, thank you very much for your time, for the conversation. And I do wish you a very blessed uh, uh, afternoon as you continue with the rest of the day. Goodbye everyone, asante ni sana. And I do hope you have all um, registered for logistical purposes. Kindly, if you haven't, make sure you don't uh, log off before you get the registration link and register. Asante sana. Panelists, kindly say kwaherini. Thank, Thank you, you, Isabel. And bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.